Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I just want to um, thank the members of the armed forces who give us our freedom that we enjoy each and every day. And let's take a moment of silence for all those who made the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, let's keep their families in our prayers and our hearts. Let's take a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Uh, 10 hundred hours, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Councilman Chaim Deutsch. I'm the chair of the Veterans Committee, and I would like to thank all of you for being here today, and I would like to extend my warmest regards to uh, the veterans who are in attendance here today. This hearing will focus on the services that the city provides to the 210,000 veterans that live across the five boroughs. DVS has already gotten off to a good start, and the legislation we are considering simply seeks to codify many of the department's existing practices. Today will be a hearing intro 391, sponsored by council members Ulrich and Brennan, who, uh, which, would, would, uh, which would amend administration code by requiring DVS to provide counseling services to veterans seeking assistance regarding federal, state, and local benefits to which they may, may be entitled to. Intro 394, also sponsored by Council Members Ulrich and Brennan, would, uh, would require DVS to establish resource centers in each borough and oblige by the commissioner to submit a report twice a year about the operations of those resource centers. Intro 396, another bill sponsored by Council Members Ulrich, Ulrich and Brennan would require DVS to maintain and periodically update a resource guide for veterans it would be available both electronically and in written format, if requested. This guide will contain information about eligibility for benefits and instructions on how to apply for federal, state, and city benefits, as well as health programs, legal and housing services, and educational and employment opportunities. Finally, intro 647, sponsored by Council Member Eugene, would require DVS to establish a a peer support hotline for veterans and offer peer support services in partnership with veteran organizations. The number for this hotline, as well as other information about these peer support services, would be posted on the DVS website. The department is now, thank God, fully staffed with a budget of approximately $4.4 million. It is, large, is, it is the largest agency of its kind in this country and it is a building out its services in a thoughtful and deliberate way. I look forward to hearing from the administration today about how this legislation can be impro improved, streamlined, and integrated with existing policy so that our service members are able to access whatever it is that they need in a timely and convenient manner. I also look forward to hearing from advocates and veterans about the experiences accessing these services and any insight they might have on how to improve the services being provided and fill any gaps in service and resource that remain. I would like to thank the committee staff council, Nuzat Saudhuri, policy analyst Michael Kurtz, and finance analyst Zachary Harris for the work in preparing this uh, hearing. Finally, I would like to recognize the committee members who have not joined us yet, so we'll skip that. We will now hear from council member, actually we will now hear from, um, we're gonna actually, we're gonna swear you in. So um, in accordance with the rules of the council, and the council will now administer the, the, the information of witnesses from the mayoral administration. So please uh, swear them in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Okay, so um, we're gonna begin with, I think, uh, Jeffrey Roy, we'll start with you. Good morning, Chair Deutsch, members of the Committee on Veterans, and bill sponsors, Councilman Ulrich, Councilman Brannon, and Councilmember Eugene. My name is Jeff Roth, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the New York City Department of Veterans Services, or DVS, as we like to say. I'm joined today by Assistant Commissioner Jamal Othman, who leads the City Employment, Education, Entrepreneurship, Events and Engagement, or CE5 Division at DVS, and our General Counsel, uh, 
Eric Henry. On behalf of DBS, I'd like to extend our appreciation for the citywide enthusiasm and support which contributed to another successful set of New York City Fleet Week and Memorial Day events. Every day we see our city wrap its arms closer around our veteran com community. By way of illustration, at a special ceremony held at City Hall in May with the mayor, Admiral Paul Zukunt, Chair Deutsch, Staten Island Borough President James Otto, veterans and Coast Guard service members, New York City was declared to be the latest and largest Coast Guard city in America. This is truly a testament to the strides our city has made to become more military friendly each and every day. In the past two years, DBS has grown dramatically from a small four-person mayoral office to an established city charter agency with several divisions dedicated to specific programmatic areas of outreach. In response to previous discussions with the city council, as well as veteran advocates, the department has put tremendous effort into, va into evaluating the best pa possible practices for connecting with the veteran population, including the delivery of information and resources to that community. The legislative proposals that the sponsors have offered are important, and we are grateful for their input, but as we continue to grow, it is vital that the agency maintain flexibility in how we connect with veterans and their families to the services they seek. I welcome this opportunity to tell you about some of the ways DBS currently conducts targeted outreach in the New York City veterans community and how those efforts are aligned with the goals of today's package bills. DBS supports, in part, the goals of intro number 391, which would require DBS to provide counseling services to veterans seeking assistance with federal, state, and city benefits that they may be entitled to based on their military service. However, the bill as drafted raises a potential legal concern that we believe presents a significant obstacle. DVS currently provides extensive counseling services to the city's veteran community. In 2017, DVS established satellite sites co-located within the borough president's offices in the Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, and Queens, and at the Brooklyn Workforce One Center on Bond Street, where veterans and their families are connected with resources and opportunities for school, jobs, and business opportunities. Each site is staffed by a DVS community outreach specialist who is trained to assist veterans with applying for health, disability, educational, or pension benefits for which they may be eligible. In addition, outreach specialists assist veterans in filing for city benefits such as Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, SNAP, and NICERS pension benefits. They connect veterans in numerous ways. They help with referrals to local legal service providers. They identify connections for employment opportunities through a partnership with SBS's Workforce One and the New York State Division of Veteran Affairs. They encourage entrepreneurship with Bunker Labs, and they connect veterans with educational services through CUNY and SUNY, to name just a few. The requirement that would mandate that counseling services be provided by agents or attorneys recognized by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs is problematic. We have identified potential liability concerns raised by having city employees assume power of attorney status for filing benefits claims on behalf of veterans. For this reason, it is more appropriate for outreach specialists to continue assisting in the preparation of veterans' benefits package submissions to the federal government, but not for them to assume the legal role suggested by the bill, referring formal accreditation by the VA. In this, we note that DVS is an excellent position to partner with other entities to provide these types of services in connection with package submissions. DVS supports the goals in part of intro number 394, which would require DVS to establish at least one veterans resource center in each borough, providing veterans with free, current information on housing, public and private social services, financial assistance, and tax exemptions available to veterans. As I mentioned earlier, in 2017, DVS established a citywide presence with satellite sites co-located within the borough president's offices in the Bronx, Manhattan, Staten, Staten Island, and Queens, and at the Brook Brooklyn Workforce One Center on Bond Street. We are grateful for the support that our host offices in the five boroughs have provided for these satellite sites, for they are a natural convening ground for the public, and they increase DVS's exposure to the veteran community. Also, these sites are accessible by public transportation, and the department's outreach specialists are trained to connect veterans and their families to trusted resources available to them from the city, state, and federal governments. In this way, these sites serve as hubs where veterans can receive one-on-one -on -one support to navigate and apply for benefits such as the GI Bill, New York State tuition, veteran property tax exemptions, and local housing support. The department understands the necessity for staff to also be mobile in order to reach our veteran population. 
Outreach specialists also provide one-on-one -on -one counseling and advice on benefits and resources at community board meetings, town halls, and other special events. In addition, the department holds its monthly DVS office hours at Civic Hall on West 22nd Street in Manhattan, where veterans and all members of the New York City community can learn more about the agency and provide feedback on when, what we can do better to support our service members. These office hours are held by DVS Press Secretary Alexis Wachowski, who advises on different topics and resources available to the veteran community, and we encourage everyone to stop by. The current satellite system functions well in light of the size and limitations of the satellite sites and staffing limitations of the agency. DVS supports the goals of intro number 396, which would require DVS to maintain and update a resource guide for veterans containing information about eligibility and the process of applying for federal, state, and city veterans benefits, special rights accorded to the veterans under the law, health programs and services, legal and housing services, small business support, educational and employment opportunities, and other available resources for veterans. In the early stages of DVS's establishment, the agency found that the content and resources included in printed resource guides changed with some regularity. And so the most versatile way to maintain this information would be online. To this end, the department maintains all of the above information on its website, where veterans can explore what benefits they may be eligible for through the Get Help section. There's a comprehensive range of information found on the site with topics ranging from eligibility and the process for applying for federal, state, and city veterans benefits, special rights accorded to veterans under the law, health programs and services, legal and housing services, small business support, educational and employment opportunities, and other available resources for veterans. For those veterans who might not have access to a computer, they can call the DBS main office where they are connected with an outreach specialist in their borough for individual personal service in navigating resources within 24 hours. Printed materials on particular topics are also mailed by DBS to a veteran upon request. DBS also issues a monthly newsletter that describes our work in the community, upcoming events, and resources available to veterans and their families. In addition, information on veteran resources is available through DBS social media, and we encourage all veterans and their families to take full advantage of the information currently available. DVS supports the goals of intro number 647, which would require DVS to establish and publicize a peer support hotline and other peer support services in partnership with veterans associations and organizations that serve veterans. Peer mentorship and support are valuable tools for ensuring that both transitioning service members and those who may be removed from the military for some time are able to lead fulfilling and productive post-service lives. Towards that end, DVS maintains a strong partnership with ProVetus, which is a trained peer mentoring program that helps veterans and service members successfully transition from the military to the civilian sector. ProVetus is also part of our Mentor Vet initiative, and DVS conducts direct referrals for veterans who wish to be connected with peer support services at no charge. In addition, ProVetus is also a member of the New York Serves platform where veterans and their families can be connected to a constellation of service providers across a myriad of needs. The DVS Mentor Event Initiative includes a list of mentoring organizations on the DVS website with links that directly connect to each organization's page. The list also includes information about the different specialties and veteran subpopulations that each organization serves. For veterans who are homeless, our veteran peer coordinators from our housing and support services team provide peer-to-peer -peer engagement to better understand the veteran's housing needs and help them navigate the apartment search process. This peer engagement continues after our veterans are housed with DBS aftercare coordinator, following up to ensure that all of our recently housed veterans transition successfully to their new home and community. Additionally, any veteran or veteran family struggling with housing stability can call our main line or our aftercare hotline and receive extensive homeless prevention assistance. All of this is done in close coordination with our sister agencies, such as HRA and the many VA-funded support services for veteran families, SSVF providers in the city. If veterans are experiencing a more complicated or dramatic need for support, such as particular mental health needs, the whole health and community resilience team connects them with institutional partners such as the Stephen A. Cohen Family Clinic at NYU Langone, their local VA vet center, NYC Well, 311, or the VA Crisis Hotline. DVS welcomes the opportunity to expand its established peer-to-peer -peer support network and looks forward to partnering with many more organizations which fill this need in the veterans community. We thank the New York City Council for its continued support in pushing forward the needs of veterans and their families in New York City. We support the goals of these bills where they do not duplicate current processes at place at DVS. 
As we continue to grow, we will continue to implement innovative processes, such as the satellite site system for connecting veterans and their families to the services they may need. Thank you again for this opportunity to meet with you today. At this time, I'd be happy to address any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, so we've been joined by Council Member uh, Brennan and Council Member uh, Maisel. So thank you. So um, what I've heard is that you support all these goals, which is, uh, which is great. And I understand that many of these services you already um, have. Um, so now, throughout the five boroughs, if you take a look, you have uh, 210,000 veterans throughout the city. And if you break them down by boroughs, um, do you have those numbers of how many veterans uh, we currently in each borough? Yes, we do. The largest is Queens, followed by Brooklyn. Uh, I've got percentages here in Queens. We have 27.9%. Brooklyn is 25.7%, followed by Manhattan at 18.3%, the Bronx uh, roughly 18%, and Staten Island 10%. Uh, so when you speak about having um, an office, uh, DVS um, satellite office in each borough, um, how many people does each office, um, how many employees do you have in each office? We have uh, one outreach specialist that is assigned to each borough and they hold office hours at the various locations in each of the satellite sites. So when you look at the, the breakdown, um, like all five boroughs, and you have um, beginning from the uh, least amount of veterans in that borough, Staten Island, and then going to the Bronx and Manhattan, and you have uh, one person doing the outreach in those three boroughs. But when you look at Brooklyn and Queens, where there, there are a lot, there's a large amount of veterans, so um, we still have one person in Queens and Bronx. So how does it work when the services are needed and the demand is high that when veterans come in, that by having one in those in Manhattan, Bronx, and Staten Island, and then having that same one individual in Queens and Brooklyn where you have a higher population of veterans. So how, how does that um, balance out? Um, when I look at these bills, I would think that maybe you would need more than one in Queens and Brooklyn because of the higher population of veterans. So the, the one individual staffs the office hours at the satellite sites, but we have a number of outreach uh, events that we attend. Uh, others from our staff may attend those events, whether it's a community board events would be attended by senior staff members. Uh, we, act, we also have our whole health and community resilience line of action, which has four outreach coordinators that are also doing work in each of those communities. So while we have one staff member that staffs the satellite site office hours, we do have a whole host of resources that are available in connecting with veterans outside of just that uh, forum. Uh, do you have the amount of, um, of veterans that reach out in each borough, like yearly? We do. We have uh, a monthly breakout, um, for example, in 2018 through its satellite offices to date. Uh, in the Bronx, we've had 91. Uh, Brooklyn, we've had nearly 80. Manhattan, 50. Queens, a little bit lower at 20. And Staten Island's been very high with 100. Can you just repeat the, um, the population in, in all five boroughs again, if you don't mind? Yep, absolutely. By percentage. Queens was 27.9%, which is roughly 58,000. Brooklyn was 25.7%, about 55,000. Manhattan is 18% or 39,000. The Bronx is 18%, about 37,500. And Staten Island, 10% at about 21,500. So when you look at the population in Queens, you have, um, you have 58,000. And you mentioned the number of 20 of people that reached out to the office. Mm -hmm. And then in Brooklyn, you have a population of 55,000, and you mentioned 80 people. And then you look at the Bronx, 
um, with a population is 37,500, you have 91, and then you look at Staten Island is 21,500, where you have a high amount of veterans that reached out. So when I'm looking at all five boroughs and the amounts of veterans that each borough serves and the amount of people that reach out to the service for the services, I, I just can't believe that like in Queens that has the highest population and only 20 veterans actually reached out for services. So um, I'm back to my previous question is that having one, um, one office staffed by one uh, peer counselor, if that's, an, if that's efficient enough, because if you have the highest population of 58,000 in Queens and there's only 20 people that took advantage of the services, I cannot believe out of 58,000 there's only 20 people that needed the services. So that's why I want to take another look to make sure that one peer counselor is, is, is sufficient that's because right. maybe you need uh, definitely maybe two or three and this way we could, re we could reach out to those uh, larger um, 58,000 people because Staten Island has 21,500, which is a smaller borough, but you have 100 people, that veterans that reached out. So maybe because Staten Island is smaller and it's easier for people to get there and to receive those services. Yeah, and the, and the data I don't have in front of me is uh, the, the number of interactions. So while only 20 went to the Queen satellite location, there are other uh, places where they could receive support from DBS. So they could be calling 311 and transferred to our main location. Uh, folks from Queens may be coming into our main location because uh, we do a number of interactions there as well or at other community events. So they may not be going uh, in as high of numbers to our satellite location, but they may be in interacting with our staff at other locations. So that's, um, you know, it's with the transit system and, you know, people, you know, people have a difficult time making ends meet and not having vehicles and paying for insurances and everything. So, you know, we don't want to have veterans going from one borough to another borough to seek those services. Uh, they should be able to go into their borough to seek those services. And what troubles me is that the services are there. We have the services. Uh, it's not like we have to come up and figure out how we're going to take care of the veterans. So I think there's like a, a, a little neglect when it comes to outreach. Um, I wouldn't say neglect, maybe a lack of manpower because I think we need to do a better job to reach out to those veterans in each borough and they should receive the services from their borough. And um, calling 311, you know, I have to try it. I have to try calling 311 to see how they direct you um, to make sure, because we keep on telling everyone, call 311 and you'll get the services. So I'm gonna call up as a veteran, I'm not a veteran, but I will call up when I'm a veteran, I'd like the services to see how 301 actually directs a, an individual to the services that are needed. Um, and if 301 um, does a good job by directing the veterans to those services, then maybe we need to do a publicity um, outreach to let people know that 301 is a way to go. And if that doesn't work, we need to better the 301 system when it comes to our veterans. And also I think um, looking at these bills, and I, you know, I'm glad that the administration is supporting them, but we should look at um, expanding the peer counselors in each borough and making sure that the 58,000 people uh, in Queens and the 55,000 in Brooklyn, and, and including Manhattan and, and Staten Island and the Bronx, that they have proper outreach um, and the veterans know that you, you definitely could come here for services. And the services are there. You know, we don't have to come up with any new services. You know, we have everything's in place and you guys are doing a great job. And, uh, and I just wanna thank the commissioner. I know she's on vacation now, she's watching now. She's doing a phenomenal job and she's really a great partner in them. Um, and she picks up the phone, and like I said, last, you know, last hearing, 11, 12 o'clock in the morning. She's always, always available. I wish the hotline was like that. Um, maybe we should transfer the hotline to the commissioner's cell phone. <laughs> that, would be, that wouldn't be a bad idea. 
Not um, while she's but, on vacation. <laughs> yeah. So uh, bef before I continue, I just want to give my colleagues an opportunity. So first, um, uh, we have a bill here sponsored by Councilmember uh, Ma uh, Matthew Eugene, um, who is sponsoring intro number 647, a local law requiring DBS to establish peer support hotline for veterans. So I want to give um, Councilmember Eugene a opportunity to speak on this bill. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, Chair uh, Dodge. And uh, let me uh, take the opportunity, first and foremost, to say thank you also to uh, Mr. Jeffrey Worth for your testimony. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you. And uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair Dodge and uh, my fellow colleagues on the Veterans Committee. My name is Matthew Eugene, as you know, and I'm the member of the committee. Chairman Dodge, uh, thank you for providing me the opportunity to discuss my bill, Intro 647, which requires the Office of Veterans Affairs to establish a peer support hotline and other peer uh, support services that would partner with a veterans association and other organizations which service uh, veterans. As someone who has served on the Veterans Committee for much of my tenure in the City Council, I know so very well the many great challenges that uh, the brave men and women who have defended uh, our, co our country face when they return to civilian life. Our veterans are people who have made the tremendous sacrifices for all of us. And there is no question that all should have the highest level of gratitude and respect for what they have done to help preserve our freedom and the thing that we hold to be the most sacred. Secret. Our veterans have experienced things that most people who have no military background would be unable to relate to. That is why they need and deserve all the support and help that they can receive from the very same society and people who they sacrifice everything for. Most important for them is having programs and systems in place where they can have support and guidance from fellow Americans who have shared many of the things that they have experienced and are particularly attuned to the challenge they face on a regular basis. And to 647 will create a valuable partnership between the Office of Veterans Affairs and organization which, which uh, work most closely with our population of veterans. I commend the current administration, Chairman Dodge and my colleagues in the City Council for expanding and improving upon the services that New York provides to our veterans. But we, of course, must always strive to do even more. And I know that this legislation will signify another positive step forward. And I want to take the opportunity also to thank all the veterans who are here and those also of them who are not here. I want to congratulate you and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chair Dodge. Thank you, Council Member Matthew Eugene. Uh, any questions to my right? No? Okay. So um, based on the uh, amount of veterans that reached out to DBS, um, are these through uh, a hotline call or are they walk-ins? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, it's a combination of uh, phone, walk-ins, and um, extensive outreach performed by our outreach specialists in the five boroughs. Um, in addition to having their satellite sites, they really use that as a launching pad to delve deeper into the communities and the boroughs that they're working in to meet the veterans where it's most convenient to them. So um, that's the primary form is that peer-to-peer um, and we think that uh, Councilmember uh, Eugene has really um, highlighted that peer-to-peer. -peer. That's, uh, that's really uh, a place that we're going as we evolve as an agency. We understand and we recognize that veterans appreciate that one-on-one -on -one, uh, concierge type um, service. Um, but uh, when it comes to how we're interacting with the veteran community, um, it's uh, primarily the one-on-one -on -one that, uh, that's happening in the outer boroughs. Um, and then uh, in Manhattan, it's uh, either walk-ins or phone calls. And that is, um, is that a full-time job? Um, 
for that individual, the peer counselor, to be at the satellite office? Is that a part-time job or full-time job? So these are full-time staff, and they staff the um, the sites. And I, I would I would stay away from using the term office because they're actually uh, within an office. They're actually a desk and and a space where they work. Uh, in conjunction with the host site, for, so for instance, in the Bronx Borough Presence Office, they work closely with the outreach staff there. Um, the only difference is our outreach staff are, are veteran specific, um, and in many cases are veterans themselves. Um, so, it's a, so it's a full-time staff member, yes, but they don't maintain full-time staff hours at the site. So, oh, so what is the exact job description of uh, that individual who works at the satellite office? In a nutshell, the, the goal of the outreach specialist is to help veterans and their family members navigate all the various um, programs, benefits, services that may be eligible to them because of their military service. Okay, so I just want to ask you to maybe look over the numbers, not today, but because like in Queens, when you mentioned that 20 people were reached out, um, and that was in, that's one month, right? Per month? Yeah, 20 people. I hope it's per month. That's, that's, tw that's year to date 2018. So for the full year, 20 people? Uh, of this year, yeah. So how is it possible for only 20 people were reached out if it's a full-time job? I mean, if it's a part-time job, it should be 2,000 people or... or so we, we have, we have office hours there uh, two to three times a week, and it's, they're not full days. They depend on the demand of walk-ins. Um, if the demand of walk-ins have uh, gotten lower, that outreach specialist is trained to then spend their time most effectively, which is out in the community, going to the veterans. If veterans don't come to us, we're gonna to go to them. Yeah, but something doesn't add up here. Um, if I was working at one of your, one of the sites, if I was working in Queens, and I'm going to meetings, veterans, with uh, veterans, and I'm going to so many different organizations and people that are involved with veterans, and then I, ha I have a full-time job and people come into my office and there's a hotline number, does each borough have a hotline where that peer council is, um, is situated? We have, a, uh, um, we have a phone system that allows anyone to call our main number. And it, it, it okay, you know, I'll get to that. I'll get yeah. to that in a minute. I'll get to, to my next question. But it just doesn't add up to me that, uh, again, if, if I was working out of Queens and for full 2018, and I ha my job is to reach out to veterans and to provide services. I'm constantly hearing from, from advocates that, you know, we, we need, you know, a lot of veterans need services. So 20 would be maybe 20 veterans a day that I would reach out to. So not, I, I, not 20 veterans. Yeah. So, not Chair, I think what this, this number doesn't uh, include is our reach. So the outreach that we're doing and those outreach efforts, how many veterans that we're connecting with outside of the satellite locations. So we'll, we'll owe that, we'll put those numbers together. What this number, the 20 is referring to, is just those that have come to that specific location. Uh, yeah, but it's, it still doesn't add up, because if, if we are spending money on, on each borough to have a, a location for veterans, um, we have to use those resources that we have. <coughs> and we have to make sure that the veterans know that this is a place for you to come. And to have 20 for a full year is like, unacceptable. That, that's right. And I think what we can do is put the numbers together that show how many veterans that we've connected with, our outreach coordinators in Queens have connected with through all of the different uh, resource fairs they attend, community events they attend, and all that. That number doesn't reflect. Yeah, but that should 20. be all an additional to the, to, right. the yeah. to the borough. So, I mean, if you come back to me and tell me that um, through the other resources you reached out to 50,000, mm -hmm. I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be very happy about that. But then just to have, you know, I, I don't want to look at the full number. We'll talk about that maybe at the next hearing. But I'm talking specifically about each borough of how that full-time worker is reaching out to the veterans. Now, 
in each borough, that person, is, is he a veteran or she a veteran? In most cases, yes. In one case, it's a spouse of someone who served in the military. Okay. So, I mean, reaching out to 20 people a year is... So I should just reiterate, it's not reaching out to 20 people. 20 people came in and were provided services. They reached out to hundreds, maybe even thousands during that same period. We just don't have the number. So from those thousands, I mean, people said, oh, I, I'm, I'm good, I'm okay, nothing, I'm happy. No, we also provided services. This is specific to the site for those particular hours. Okay, so I, I just want to mention that in the last six months, um, when I became chair of the Veterans Committee, I've already, uh, I think I've already almost gone to all five boroughs visiting um, uh, different um, homeless shelters, veteran homeless shelters, and supportive housing. And uh, I'm, going, I'm going to make it my business now to go visit all five locations in all five boroughs and see how it, how, see how it operates. Uh, and then maybe I'll take a walk with the peer council to reach out to some of the organizations to see how they do the outreach. Um, I, I just hope that the next time we sit here with the, those numbers go a lot higher because this is totally, like I'm gonna say it again, to hit about 20 and 80 and 50 and 91. And again, it just proves it because in Staten Island it's a smaller borough and the numbers went up. And even 100 throughout for 2018 is a very low number, having 21,500 veterans in Staten Island. Uh, that also is kind of low. Um, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, this is something that we need to look into, and that's why some of these bills are extremely important, and these hearings are, are important. And I, I, I really, you know, I speak to DBS all the time, and I speak to the commissioner. I never knew that these numbers um, are kind of disturbing. Um, so, what is the process for a veteran uh, to get help at one of the DV, one of the satellite offices? So, can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, well, if they're a walk-in, um, the walk-in hours don't pr don't need any sort of appointment. So, any veteran or family member could walk in and see one of our outreach specialists. Our outreach specialists are then trained. So, there's one person per satellite office. Yes. So you mentioned that that individual might be out at community events. So what happens when nine to five and and he or she is out at, at a community event and may come knocking on the door? Who answers the door? So we have published office hours where we always have someone on site. When um, outside of those published office hours that are publicized, um, again, this is a desk within a host site, yeah, they, would, they would interact with someone at the host site who would then take down their information for the outreach specialist. So is that person who's gonna be at the host site, is he or she a veteran? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Is he or she trained? I can't, I can't answer that. We're, we're, it's, it's up to the host site to so, identify those. So we don't know, um, because the host site doesn't work for DBS. Correct. Right. So we don't know how many people, like those numbers in Queens, you mentioned 20 people that came in for help in 2018. That number could be a lot higher, but we don't know how many people maybe may have got turned away because that person who works and who is the host at that site, um, just say, we'll say come back another time, no one's here and not take the information. Do you have like a, a sign-in sheet that someone, um, at that host site will take down information for the peer counselor? Yes, they'll take down the information and make the referral to the outreach specialist. And that still adds up to 20 in Queens? Yes. With, uh, is there a hotline at the host site? There is not, it's a desk and a chair. All right, um, I think this is something we still need to, well, you know, work to be done and to see how we could make sure, you know, I'm not looking to raise the numbers just to raise the numbers, but I'm sure that if, you know, we speak to 58,000 veterans in Queens and ask them is that if everything's okay, 
I don't think they're all going to say that yeah, everything is fine and, and there's, there's no issues. And they might, as well, they might say, you know, yeah, we have, we don't know who to reach out to. Um, and we, or we went to this satellite office and nobody was there. So we have to figure out how to do a better job at these satellite offices and make sure that those veterans get, get reached out to because 210,000 veterans and 210,000 veterans in the city of New York and five satellite sites and a total of a 350 approximately veterans at these five sites and all five boroughs actually receive some type of interaction uh, with the peer counselor at these sites. Doesn't add up. Doesn't make sense. I think, Mr. Chair, once we uh, we get those numbers for you for for the veterans and family members that we do interact and assist outside the satellite sites in that borough, I think it'll provide a clearer picture. But we're but we're happy to discuss how we can make any improvements with you. Yeah, uh, I just I appreciate it. I just want to make sure that those satellites are not a waste of time. Uh, either we staff those satellites and make sure that someone is there from nine to five or we close them up and we figure out something else another way to reach out to the veterans or maybe that peer counselor the staffer should be out in the field all the time and refer them to one main location so instead of having the veterans come to you so this is something that needs to be discussed with advocates and and dvs and to see how we could make this better um, uh, now, are there any uh, new developments DBS has been working on r with regards to the satellite offices? Like we just spoke about um, trying to improve these satellite offices. So is there anything that you had planned on doing a better job and reaching out? Or is this is status quo, this is what it is? So the satellite sites were just a start and we always envision these satellite sites as launching pads to go deeper into the community and go into areas that are typically not serviced um, by outreach specialists or by other veteran service organizations. So um, one of the things that we want to do as we evolve and we have been doing is our outreach specialists have become more mobile. Um, so outside of those um, committed uh, office hours, they're grabbing their laptop, they're grabbing their phones, they have access to the internet, and when they interact with veterans out where it's convenient to the veteran, they could provide services right there on the spot. So th they're, they're, they're a walking office, so to speak. Got it, all right, before I give, um, uh, my colleague has some questions here. But before I, I have one more question, before I'll give it over to Councilmember uh, Matthew Eugene, who in DVS has oversight? Who's in charge of the oversight um, on all these five satellites? Do you have someone who looks over these satellite offices in all five boroughs, or you just send them out and say, okay, just go go out there and do outreach, and you know, come back tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning? So supervision of the staff themselves is DVS, and that falls under me. The oversight of the satellite sites themselves is, is done, it's a partnership with the host sites. But ultimately, the host site is the owner of the space. Uh -huh. Okay, um, Council Member Eugene, you have questions? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know that, uh, Chair, the chairman has asked a civil question about the 20 people who seek uh, assistance or help. But uh, when we know that uh, in New York City we have over 200,000 veterans in New York City, and in Queens alone we have over 50,000 you know, of veterans, so the 20 people, we don't know how to explain that. That's, uh, that's unbelievable. But I'm not going to ask questions about the 20 people because uh, you have been asked uh, so many questions about it already. But if somebody asks you why you believe that only 20 people reach out you know, to the organization for 
for assistance, only 20 people. Why? So can we explain how we can explain that among over 50,000 people in Queens and over 200,000 people in New York City, only 20 veterans reach out you know, to you for help. Since we know that the veterans, they are facing so many challenges. And I can, yes, what I'm saying, we know that the veterans, they are facing so many challenges. And I can tell you honestly, I walk my district. Many people came to me, they are veterans. As a council member, we have trouble. We need help. And I remember I went, uh, I was in one of the hospitals, you know, just for a visit. And I witnessed a situation facing by a veteran. The guy was mad and sad, and that was not acceptable. Because he said he doesn't know what to do, where to go. So what would be your answer to that? Why only 20 people, 20 veterans? I know that you have, you know, I'm not talking about the outreach that you have uh, uh, done, reaching out people, veterans in the community, providing services in other ways. I'm talking about people reaching out to your organization. Now, I think we could all hypothesize, you know, think about all different ways of, of why veterans may not or are not coming into satellite offices or are seeking services. I think, I think you, you're very right. I think if you talk to veterans, one of the biggest things that they'll tell you is that um, they didn't know services programs exist, whether it's federal, state, or city level, which is why, as an agency, we made it our mission to focus on navigation. When it comes to why you're not seeing more numbers, again, there could be a whole host of reasons. I can't predict why. I think one of the things that we can work together on is, and knowing that a lot of veterans don't know these services exist, is on um, publicity. I think we could, I think we could work together on um, more communication about the fact that you have this new agency in the city, with with your local communities, um, letting them know that they could get services. When you interact with veterans, like you said, that have challenges and issues. Send them directly to us. Make that direct, warm handoff. As a veteran, I could tell you we could be a little bit stubborn. Um, it's not as easy as saying, well, you know what? There's a service office right over there. You just walk over there tomorrow. Sometimes you have to push them a little bit. And that's where we need the help of, of family members of the public and of our elected officials. So I think, I think that could be p potentially one of, the, w one of the things that we could work together on to improve is the publicity of the office, of the satellite sites, and of the services that we provide. And we would love to work better on the communication aspect. Um, with all due respect, you know, the lack of knowledge of information, you know, that prevent the veteran to seek assistance. I have been hearing that since I came to the city council since I was uh, uh, the chairman of the veterans community myself, we had several public hearings over that to improve the outreach to veterans, to let them know that those programs exist. Because for people who made the uh, utmost sacrifice, you know, the, for all of us who put their life in danger, when they came back to New York and they are suffering because of lack of information, this is not acceptable, mm -hmm. not acceptable. They deserve much more than that. I think that um, that should be a, one of the priorities of DVS, to make sure you do an aggressive outreach. Let the people know that if we have the services, we have the services, we have the, the resources, come on, we got to make the effort, you know, for the veteran to use the services because they need it or they need the services, they need them. Because I'm telling you honestly, when I walk the street or and I saw some veterans who fought for this country and the condition they are living, the challenges they are facing, you know, it is not acceptable. I feel very upset about that. It is very, very embarrassing. So I wish, you know, uh, my hope is to see that the DVS, you know, put the, uh, make a, 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 this a priority to reach out to the veterans to make sure that they know the services exist. Because it is sad. For people after serving, when they come back, they have really, you know that, they have trouble. They need assistance. But the other thing that I want to say, 
And I love saying that because my father only, always say, my son, there's no perfection. I don't say that you don't do any, the best that you can do. I don't, you don't do anything. This is not what I'm saying. But there's always ways to strive and to do better. And my father always said that there's no perfection. Every single day, my son, you got to go to bed. Before you go to bed, think about what you have done during the day, what you have done during the week, and see what was good. How can you improve what you have done? So you, I know you have an outreach uh, system. But could you tell us about the way or the, the technique, uh, the system that you use to evaluate if the outreach that you are doing is working? Because you have to evaluate. If you are try to, out, to, to reach out to some people, you say, my goal is to reach 100 people today. You got to get a goal, 100 people today. If I don't, at the end of the day, I got to go back and see, did I reach 100 people? If not, why? If I did, can I reach 200 tomorrow? So what is your evaluation system just to quantify, you know, uh, uh, how many people you reach every time and to evaluate if your outreach system works? So first off, I want to um, thank your father for those wise uh, words of wisdom. I think he's absolutely right. And, and we'd love to discuss with you further um, any ideas for enhancing um, our, our outreach. So that's, that's without saying. Um, when it comes to evaluation, we are striving to become a more of a data-driven organization. As you know, when you were the chair under the Mayor's Office of Veteran Affairs, um, it was a very small office, four to five people, um, and they reacted more like they did a great job with what they had, but they were more reactionary. We want to be more proactive based on what the needs are in the community, and only data could tell us that, evaluation, like you just said. So with regard to that, what we are doing is we are taking steps to establish a CRM system, whereas before we were using you know, rudimentary tracking systems that really didn't tell you any sort of um, um, intelligence that you could act on. It just basically tracked basic information, whereas now we are instituting a CRM system that will be able to track all the data. We'll be able to input it. Um, um, all the satellite sites, folks at the main office, walk-ins, you have one source to input information that will be able to crunch those numbers and will be able to make real-time evaluative uh, uh, decision-making based on that data. That's what we're currently working on, and that is our goal and what we are striving for. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, we in, this, in the community, of veterans community, we are willing to work together with you. And I know the chair, this is the goal of the chair, and to see how we can work together to improve the outreach uh, system, because all veterans, they deserve so much, and we owe them uh, so much also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you, you Councilmember Eugene. Uh, uh, Councilmember Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to, to go back um, on, on to Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, Brooklyn, obviously, b very near and dear to my heart. Um, both boroughs have more than 50,000 veterans, um, and I assume they have additional, additional needs that the other boroughs may, you know, with, with less, uh, less of a veteran population may not have. Um, not only have you considered adding services and staff to these boroughs that have larger uh, veteran populations, but do you have info on, on sort of how, um, as far as equity with, um, you know, how equally each borough is served relative to the borough's veteran population? What I can tell you is that we have five staff, we have five boroughs, and we, based on the need, because you're right, there are varying needs in each borough, um, we adjust the, um, the staffing of those sites. So for instance, um, there may be a lot of activity going on in, in Brooklyn a particular month or a particular week. We would bolster that one outreach specialist with a staff from some other borough that is not 
that does not have as much activity for that week or month. We also have staff that work at our main office that can also reinforce any particular borough who happens to have more activity. So whenever there's an increase in demand, we've been able to meet it. Sort of um, on a a la carte basis, I guess. Like from, I got fr From time to time, we can make adjustments, but most of the time, we've been able to um, identify the correct amount of resources for each <coughs> borough. Okay. Um, I mean, is it, is it something that you're keeping an eye on? I mean, I assume, um, you know, with, with all due respect to Staten Island, if they have the lowest, they have the lowest um, veteran population, I would assume, you know, Brooklyn or Queens w would require more on, on a resource level than Staten Island would. I can't speak to what the exact needs of each borough are. Um, I think we're making the assumption larger, larger population, more needs. Um, with a larger borough also comes other organizations that also provide support services. Um, but, but I think o overwhelmingly, yes, there would be an increase in, in needs. Um, what I can say is, Right now, we've been able to meet those needs. Whether we need those going forward, I can't speak to that. I think when we institute the CRM and we learn more about the population that we're serving, I think we'll you know, course correct as needed mm -hmm. to provide those additional resources where needed. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I you know, speak for the chair and that we want you to succeed. So, I mean, I think if there are needs there, you know, it's, it's up to you guys to let us know. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I'm basing it on just the data that's before me that I, looking at this, you know, in a supply and demand, uh, purely in a supply and demand sort of fashion, I would assume Brooklyn and Queens are the largest veteran population. They're going to need more than the guys in Staten Island or the Bronx. Um, and that's just, you know, it's, it's up to us, it's up to you to, to make sure we're looking after that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Councilmember. So um, I'm not going to take up uh, all morning um, to ask you questions, um, but I think we understand where we are, we are at right now. And you know, if if I if if there's a car dealer that purchases 20 cars and that person doesn't advertise, no one's buying cars. And the only way for people to come down even look at the cars is by them reaching out and advertising and everything. So I see there's really, um, you know, I'm just like, you know, these numbers. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be going out to all five boroughs and we'll, the next hearing, I, I'd like to I just know, have a better idea on what, you know, what Council Member G Matthew G mentioned is that, you know, people say in the police department there's a quota. You gotta come back with a certain amount of tickets. Uh, I would like to see a quota here not in the police department, but with EVS, that they should be mandated to reach out and say, you know, something, we gotta, we gotta strive every day to reach out to more and more people and just to get those numbers up and to get the services better. Um, many of the veterans, they don't have computers at home. And, uh, and I, I, would, I would also like to see, uh, by visiting the homeless shelter, veteran homeless shelters, is that many veterans are waiting for housing. They have been already told that uh, we are preparing an, an apartment for you, whether it's uh, um, an apartment or supportive housing, but, and they're complaining, they're saying it's been like five months when they told me this and nothing's happening. So I would like to see more, um, you know, from DVS being involved with those veterans who are in these homeless shelters spread out throughout the city to streamline the process and to make sure that if there is an apartment available, it shouldn't remain empty. And while visiting some of the supportive housing, there were empty, empty rooms, empty apartments. And some of the reasons why they weren't occupied yet is because if uh, unfortunate is if a veteran passed away and the NYPD closed up that apartment and it took weeks before they unsealed it so I spoke, I had a conversation with the police commissioner about this, 
that we need to make sure that especially um, in support of housing, uh, for those that are looking for residence, if a, an apartment is closed up, uh, sometimes it's, um, you know, if it's something like an unfortunate situation where there's family members, I mean, when there's family members, sometimes they have to wait for the family to pick up their belongings, so that's understandable. But if there's no family and they can't find family, then they shouldn't have to wait weeks for the NYPD to come and unseal that apartment because the detective may be too busy. So those apartments need to be opened right away and those uh, veterans must be able to move into those apartments and out of the homeless shelter. So um, I wanna thank you for your partnership and I, I'm, I'm sorry, we've, you know, I, you know, we speak a lot, we speak a lot on the phone, we have meetings, and I'm proud to say that um, with, my, through my, with my colleagues in the City Council, we'll be able to, we're able to raise the initiatives in the City Council, additional million dollars for, for our veteran groups. And I wanna thank all those veteran advocates and those who uh, do it as a job and those who volunteer, and I see plenty of people in here who just do it out of their hearts and who are veterans themselves. So I wanna thank you for everything you do on behalf of you know, the veterans, 210,000 veterans in the city of New York and the veterans across uh, our country. And you're all really, you know, um, really dedicated. And I always made a commitment, and I don't think anyone could tell me I didn't say this, that when people have to reach out to me, they speak to my deputy chief of staff who's over there and make an appointment uh, and I put on my schedule. Uh, but for all the veteran groups and for any veteran throughout the city of New York, I tell them no appointment necessary. You could just walk into my office at any time. It's an open door policy. And I want to just reiterate that to each and every one of you. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, doing great things together and working with DVS. So thank you, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner coming down here and, and testifying. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next hearing. And uh, also thank you for your support in kind of finding these bills and uh, working with my colleagues to make sure that uh, the voices are heard and, and this partnership is there. And, um, and my goal again is to not reduce uh, veteran homelessness, but to totally eliminate veteran homelessness, and I'm working with my colleagues in Warden Avenue, Jimmy Van Bramer, to come up with some type of uh, solution maybe to expand the Warden Avenue location to do a rezoning uh, for all veterans to turn it into a supportive housing, and, uh, and also working with H HPD uh, to set aside, and, uh, and there's nothing less that we should do for our, for our veterans. So thank you very much. We can now listen to the advocates and who are gonna be testifying here. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you, Chair, for your leadership thank and you. partnership. Uh, David Titus from ILAG. Melissa Malfitas. If I pronounce your name wrong, I apologize ahead of time. Uh, Reed Bennett. Uh, Armando Crescenzi. Turn on your mic, thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Armando Crescenzi. 
Good morning, committee members, chair, and uh, fellow veterans advocates. My name is Amanda Crescenza with Veterans First. I'm from the Bronx, District 13. My councilman is the Honorable Mark Onai. Uh, I come here today because uh, there are a few things that, are, that uh, I like to say about uh, outreach and veteran services and how the city is, is reaching out. And I'm, I may have some suggestions uh, to assist the, the Department of Veteran Services do a little bit of a better job. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of all the proposals. Uh, it's just the fact that how many more how many more veteran services organizations does the city need to provide the type of services that Department of Veteran Services is purporting to provide? I mean, are they more than just uh, an overpaid bulletin board? I mean, are they just a referral service? I hear words like interacting, connecting, assisting, providing, servicing. I mean, are they more than just a, a human telephone book? What are they doing? I, I've been interviewed at City Hall on the 22nd floor at Department of Veteran Services. The interview went on for an hour. We came up with a lovely checklist of all the places I'm gonna be sent to for the services that I need. That was months ago. I never had a follow-up, right? So even though I'm in favor of satellite services throughout the boroughs, if we're gonna replicate a service that really is redundant to begin with with all the other veteran services organizations out there, shouldn't we get good at it first? I mean, shouldn't the Department of Veteran Affairs come up with the numbers to prove that they are worthy of the funding to go out and help veterans who need help. Having said that, I want to go to my testimony. <laughs> I think your time is up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I work as a street vendor. So I, I just want to answer your question. Um, so first of all, um, like I mentioned before, we have been able to raise the uh, Veterans Initiative uh, to $2.3 million this year which went to approximately 15 different uh, advocate groups. And uh, I met with the commissioner uh, just last week. And we will be having a roundtable uh, meeting with all these, with all the organizations and all the advocates, as well as uh, the commissioner and the staff. Um, each organization will be providing the services that uh, will be explaining the services that they, that they that they provide for the veterans. And there will be oversight to make sure that the veterans, um, whatever their needs are, are met. Uh, there is certain gap in services. So this year I was proud to um, you know, uh, add additional funding to some other groups to close that gap. And I'm sure we'll still find more gap in services in certain ways. And whatever you, you just spoke, whatever you just mentioned, we're going to make sure that it's not just referrals, is that veterans are being helped. And uh, you'll come back at the next hearing if you want. And if you have any specifics, uh, you could always speak to me after the hearing, and we'll get to the bottom of it. Now you I, can do, go I do have one other point specifically. Um, as a disabled vet, I street vend um, pursuant to New York State Law GBL 35. Uh, New York State law provides that disabled vets can street vent anywhere in the city of New York. Uh, what has happened, we're speaking about outreach, and this is kind of like a shutdown, because since Department of Veteran Services has been created, when I call the council members, they tell me, oh, you're in luck. We have the Department of Veteran Services who can help you. And then I call the Department of Veteran Services, and they refuse to help us with any street vending issues at all. We need help with all the agencies, Department of Health, uh, MTA, Department of Transportation. I mean, citywide, we need help. So we're talking about outreach. We're getting shut down in a lot of ways. And just to wrap things up succinctly as possible, Department of Consumer Affairs- Is this part of your testimony? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Department of Consumer Affairs maintains a list of disabled vets who have come forward to the city of New York seeking a vending license Mostly, all of us need help besides the vending license. 
I mean, we need help with the vending also. We need the protection and we need the support, and we're trying to, we're trying to maintain some, dig some dignity out there. Um, we're not getting any support from anyone. We're really on our own out there. So I would suggest that the Department of Veterans Services create a particular office that reaches out to consumer affairs and starts with the list of the thousands of disabled vets who are already registered with the city of New York, who are already disabled, and help us. Help us with all our other veterans' benefits that you are purporting to provide services and counseling for, and help us build our businesses. Protect us from some of the insanity and the injustice from some of the other agencies. You know, the nuttiness we, fa we face out there every day on the street. The turnover of veterans on the, on the consumer affairs list is like 50 or 60% every year. You know, I used to advise veterans, come on out, get a vending license, this will work for you. I can't do that anymore. They come on out on the street and they get driven off. They're harassed by the police and other city agencies. It's insane. I just can't understand why Department of Veterans Services refused to help disabled vets who are licensed for consumer affairs and need help build, building the, uh, some self-sufficiency for their own business. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And if you want, you could um, speak to my deputy chief of staff who's here, and, and uh, if you, uh, I'll respond to those, to those questions, okay? Um, she'll give you my, my email address. You'll always get a response, okay? So don't She's wait. Great, so don't wait for a hearing to um, let out, you know, your frustrations. I look forward to and I know you let out your frustration because you didn't read off your testimony, and it's better sometimes to speak from the heart, so I, so I appreciate that. Okay, so uh, you could always reach me anytime, 24 hours. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, Chair Deutsch, council members and staff, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to to express our support for the proposed bills on benefits counseling services for veterans and creating veterans resource centers and guides, a resource guide. My name is David Titus. I'm an attorney with the Legal Health Division of New York Legal Assistance Group, or NILAG. I'm joined here by my colleague, Melissa Malfettis, coordinating attorney for NILAG's Veterans Legal Assistance Program, uh, which works with veterans outside the VA system. Legal Health has served over 1,000 veterans in VA medical centers, uh, clinics for behavioral health, geriatrics, women's health, and in transition and care management for post 9 11 veterans, uh, which uh, much of this work involves assisting veterans in obtaining VA benefits as well as other legal issues. The application and claim process for obtaining VA benefits is highly complex. Uh, veterans Going through this process without representation can often feel overwhelmed and frustrated. And so uh, it's no surprise that VA statistics show that uh, an, a veteran's best chance at obtaining these benefits on appeal is to have an attorney accredited by the VA representing them on their appeal. Uh, so we're in full support of uh, the proposals and would urge that a VA accredited attorney be an integral part of those services. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Melissa. Good morning and thank, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I would first like to say that I was um, very excited to uh, read the budget and I'm very happy that um, the city council in the city is, is really taking this issue seriously. Um, I, I do believe, I, I myself am a former service member and um, everyone on my staff is either a service member or the close relative of a service member. I take that seriously. Um, my program um, right now is staffed by one full-time attorney, one half-time attorney, and one paralegal. Um, that's who's on staff at my program. Everyone else um, is either a pro bono volunteer or um, a, a law student intern, um, and I have also recruited disabled veterans uh, to come and intern at the office. Um, specifically undergraduate students. So uh, that's who I have working in my program. And um, to speak to uh, 391 for a moment, I noticed um, the, a couple of key phrases. The first is counseling services. And our hope, um, based on what David just shared, my hope is that that includes attorneys, um, as it states, and that counseling services really means representation. Because we can counsel and, and advise uh, veterans all day long on how to obtain benefits, but without tangible, real help, um, sometimes the process is too daunting, it is too confusing, and the process at the end of the day is legal in nature, and so having an attorney work um, toward the, the goal of obtaining VA specifically disability benefits um, 
not only helps veterans uh, achieve more financial stability and move away from homelessness, but it also helps them move away from the city public assistance uh, the safety net and onto federal benefits, which is a benefit for the city, it's a benefit for veterans and for their families. So it's, it's win it all around. Um, the, other, the other thing that I would just like to share is that our program right now, um, in the last year, served about 600 veterans. I would like to see expansion there. Um, NILAG overall last year served about 1,800 veterans in total. And you know that was services across the board. That was eviction prevention, foreclosure prevention. That was um, healthcare access, uh, access to Medicaid and Medicare. That was estate planning. And the most common request that our veterans hotlines receive, and I, I believe I can speak for, for legal health and for myself when I say the most common request that we receive is for assistance in navigating the VA disability benefit landscape. That's all I have, and um, to. To sum up, we are um, totally in support of the passage of these bills. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you for your service. And I appreciate you taking the time to come down here uh, this morning. Um, so we'll get now to um, Harith. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was nice meeting you this morning. Yes, thank you. Hopefully, I won't be redundant. Yeah, that's um, fine. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Councilmember Brennan for sticking around because usually when uh, after the hearings, uh, when advocates testify, we usually have like an empty table here. <laughs> so I want to thank the council member for, for being here. So I'd like to greet you, council member and m members and staff and the chair, of course. My name is Reed Bennett. I'm a proud former Marine Corps infantry officer. Other than the twitch and the hearing loss, I think I'm okay, but you tell me. Um, so I have recent, I am also a member of NYU's uh, Veterans Future Labs located in Brooklyn, if you know it, at Industry City, call me a vetrepreneur. We also thank uh, the borough for uh, supporting us there. Um, also, I've recently moved to New York City from Detroit. Uh, I guess that makes me 210,000 vets plus one. And, uh, as I'm told, or at least we're told outside of New York City, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So I'm hopefully going to be able to prove that to the positive. Um, so as I told the chair briefly uh, before this, and if you don't mind be, me being redundant, because I welcome uh, anyone who might be interested in what I'm up to, to come up to me, and I can come to them, obviously. So I'm the founder of a venture capital-backed startup called HeroHomes.com. Think of it as a Zillow for military veterans or Realtor.com military veterans focused on VA loan guarantees, which in New York City is up to a no money down 679,650. Obviously, all of the 210,000 of us don't qualify for any of that to the maximum, but still, that is the maximum amount. And what we are specifically focused on is that few of us vets, if not none of us do not know that we can use this uh, buying power to buy and be a resident landlord in a two, three, or four family property, and one of those units can be a commercial unit. So I know in New York City and in the rest of the country, it's the best landlord's market in 70 years, which also translates into the worst renter's market in 70 years. So again, there's more to be said about this. But if you take in Brooklyn, which I guess I am now a Brooklynite, being at the Futures Lab and having lived there for the last week or so, so if you'll please allow me to be one of you. Um, with Brooklyn's 55,000 vets, that, ru that roughly translates into an unrecognized and untapped $37.4 billion. And what do they say, a billion here, a billion there? It starts to be real money. So what I would suggest and, and welcome a discussion with anybody how I can input into what you're doing because obviously uh, intentions are good and effort is good too, but in the end of the day, you know, s money seems to drive things. So again, my name is Reed Bennett. I'm with herohomes.com. My email is reed at herohomes.com. And thank you for the honor so new into my residency in New York City to be addressing the city council. It's unbelievable, so thank you. Well, thank you, Reed. On behalf of the 210,001 veterans, I want to thank you. 
Thank you very much, and thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks again for coming down. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to call up now uh, Evans Wang and uh, Hannah Sinoe. So this time we won't go clockwise. We'll do ladies first. Is this on? Great. Yes. Chairman Duch and distinguished members of the committee, on behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and our more than 425,000 members, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on the pending legislation before the New York City Council Committee on Veterans. My name is Hannah Sinaway, the Senior Veteran Transition Manager, Operations and Outreach Lead with IAVA's Rapid Response Referral Program, or RIP for short. RIP is IAVA's high-tech, high-touch referral service for veterans and their families with a complete and comprehensive case management component. To date, RIP has served over 8,700 veterans and family members, and nearly 1,000 veterans and family members in New York City alone, providing critical support and resources to ensure this city's veterans' needs are effectively met. After 14 years, IAVA has become the preferred empowerment organization for post-9-11 veterans. While our members are spread throughout the nation, we are proud to say that our national headquarters is located in New York City. Since its beginning, IAVA has fought for and has been successful in advocating for policies that are able to meet the needs of our newest generation of veterans. We are pleased that DVS has an increased budget for fiscal year 2019 and an increase of $1 million for the Council's Veterans Initiative and an overall positive funding outlook to support New York City veterans. Our testimony today is focused on four bills before the committee. First, 391 to require the DVS to provide counseling services to veterans by VA accredited counselors and have locations within all five boroughs. 394 would, in addition to requiring DVS to establish accessible veteran resource centers to provide veterans with free information on housing, social services, financial assistance, and tax exemptions that are available to them, the bill would also require DVS to submit a semi-annual report on the frequency of services offered and the number of veterans utilizing the service. INT 396 would mandate that the DVS create an online and paper resource guide for veterans to cover eligibility and the application process for various veteran services at the federal, state, and local levels. Finally, 647 would establish a peer support hotline and provide other peer support services in partnership with veterans organizations. This number would be posted online alongside other peer-to-peer -peer services offered. IAVA is supportive of the intention behind these bills. However, after consulting New York City veterans advocates, it appears that these bills are redundant with current DVS programs already in place. IAVA would like to hear the committee's concerns with the current programs in place and their reasoning for moving forward with the proposed legislation. Additionally, IAVA would rather see the DVS budget of 4.6 million for fiscal year 2019 focused on a number of shortfalls that are not currently being addressed. Namely, the Brooklyn VA hospitals repeated cutbacks and affordable housing options for veterans through strengthening the VA home loan program. IAVA would encourage the committee to spend its time and resources on these pressing issues that do not currently have solutions rather than reinforcing programs that already exist through both DVS and VSO programs. Members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to share IAVA's views on these issues today. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks for coming down today. Um, so I would love to set up a meeting, listen to your ideas. So we're going to get um, um, Tova. She'll get the information. Excellent. Thank and you. I would love to hear it. And um, I think like these bills are some of the things, I mean, that DVS is already doing and just to codify what they're already, what's already in place. And so I think it's important to make sure that these services continue. 
I w- I'd love to hear from you and, uh, and get your feedback on different initiatives and, uh, and also additional, you know, possibly to get uh, more funding for different resources. I so appreciate thank you very that. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Evans. Hello. Hey. Uh, hey, good morning. Um, thanks so much. Uh, so probably going to read a little bit of this, but just wanted to say thanks for kind of calling out like that, that 20 number. That was kind of low. And uh, just really drilling down and setting those goals and making sure that that outreach is there. Um, I don't want to be one of those statistics, but I, I had no idea these services. And, uh, and they could be very useful. Um, so my name is Evans Wang. Uh, I'm a Queens resident. I might oh, be you're Queens. You might be 21. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually moving to Brooklyn, uh, taking a new position. Uh, but I'm a, the chapter leader for an organization called Operation Code. Um, what it is, it's a national nonprofit that helps veterans transition into tech careers. That's both uh, the veteran, the military veteran, as well as the military spouse. I uh, previously served as a field artillery captain uh, with uh, two deployments, one to Kuwait and Iraq, and the other to South Africa, which is amazing. Um, I'm still currently serving as a reservist, where I teach ROTC at uh, City College, right there in um, Upper Manhattan. I'm very fortunate to be a member of uh, WeWork and the Veteran in Residence, this sweet t-shirt, um, program, in which it provides uh, six months of free uh, workspace within the WeWork. Um, in addition, it's provided me a huge support network of mentors, leaders, and the huge community, or the tribe as they call it, um, that has helped me grow professionally and personally. Um, the WeWork program has connected me to other businesses as a unique opportunity uh, that really helps out the startup community. Um, unfortunately, not all veteran uh, business owners have access to these same resources. And many, many veteran entrepreneurs are left uh, without adequate resources to help them navigate sometimes the complicated bureaucracies of what they need to get the help that they need, if that made sense. Um, so really, I'm just here to say that I support the intros of uh, 0391, 0394, 0396, and 0647. Um, basically, I just appreciate you guys uh, introducing the bill and really just want to lend my support uh, to that. That's really all I got, unless you have any questions for me. Thank you, Evans. And with your busy schedule, thank you for coming down this morning. Uh, and I hope, I'm not going to ask you where you live, but I hope you're going to be moving into my district. Wow. Yeah. Flatbush. Yeah. All right. That's uh. pretty close. Flatbush is divided into four districts, so I'm not going to ask you what street because yeah, yeah. we're online. <laughs> but if it's my part of Flatbush, then you're in my district. Absolutely. Okay, so you could Google your address, and then you'll find out who your council member will be. Thanks yeah. so much. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for coming down. Thank you. Um, so anyone else want to testify? No? All right. Uh, I, once again, I just want to thank all the advocates. I want to thank you all for um, coming down this morning, and uh, thank you um, all the members of DVA, Department of Veterans Services, uh, for testifying, for being here this morning, and for your partnership uh, throughout the last six months. And I look forward to continuing on what we started and what my predecessor, uh, Council Member Eric Ulrich, uh, um, um, from his accomplishments working with DVS and all the advocate groups. So many good things to come. Thank you very much. And thanks from Detroit, Detroit, right? Detroit, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great morning and enjoy your day. It's, uh, I'll give you the weather update if you just give me one minute. <laughs> and thank you for flying with the New York City Council.